Hello and welcome to another episode of Word on the Street. If you've not joined me here before, then welcome. My name is Katie Street and I am the host for your podcast today, but also, well, I guess without blowing my own trumpet, a bit of a new biz and marketing expert. I've worked in the space, as I talk about with my lovely guest today, 23 years. I mean, that is pretty scary. Uh, And I'm not even that old yet. I just started young. So I hope that today you are going to get lots of knowledge around how to market your business to attract and win more new clients. But we really delve into something that I am incredibly passionate about, actually quite towards the end of the podcast. So do stick with us today. I have with me my fantastic friend and also a previous podcast guest, as well as an ex-colleague of mine, the fantastic Anna Bravington. Anna is now co-founder and strategist at Those That Dare. They specialize in digital marketing strategy, but specifically the strategic side of things, as well as Anna being a content specialist. And we do talk a bit about content and how to create content that really gets you heard. But also some of you that are regular listeners will recognize Anna because previously she came on the podcast when she headed up marketing for Game, as in Game the Gaming Company. So she has loads and loads of knowledge, both agency and client side. We really delve into how agencies can get their voice heard, how businesses can get their voice heard, and why it is truly important to create businesses that attract diverse culture to make sure that you're talking to your audience and engaging with your audience in the right way to get cut through. And I think diversity is hugely important in that. So, without further ado, let's go and meet Anna. Hello, Anna, and I'm proud to say, welcome back to Word on the Street. Woohoo! I know. <laughs> I'm glad to be back. Glad to be back. Oh, I'm it. so excited to chat to you today. So, um, for those of you that haven't heard Anna before, she has been on the podcast previously, but with a totally different hat on because last time you were with us, Anna, you were in the mar- or running marketing for Game. And now yep. you're back. Not only you have your own podcast, but also you have founded your own agency. So I think that's going to be something that I'd really like. I mean, I know we've got a specific subject today. So we're going to be talking about how to get your brand voice heard. However, we're going to start by talking about your journey, setting up your own agency business. So tell me a little bit, one, about why you started and two, I guess you know, where you are today and the journey that you've been on so far. So I didn't have the traditional agency start story because I never actually intended to uh, start an agency. So when I finished a game and then I worked for a little while at WeView, uh, which was an online sort of Netflix type platform. And then I was made redundant and I thought, oh, I'm just going to go back in house because it's nice and easy and I love it. You know, I really love being at the heart of a brand and I just find it naturally easier than uh, agency side. So I was like, yeah, this is great. But a week after I finished at my last job, I got super sick. And um, basically my gallbladder practically exploded. I was in and out of A&E and uh, for about two months. And I was so, so sick. Like I got jaundice, I got internal bleeding. Oh, it was just an absolute nightmare. So then what I did is I... I thought, oh, do you know, I'm going to take the summer off with my six year old and because I had no childcare and I took the summer off with him. And then towards the end of the summer, people started noticing I wasn't doing anything. So I got these messages like, what are you doing now? Um, fancy a project, you know, just from my network. <laughs> so I was like, okay, then. Um, so what I did is I'd actually signed contracts um, with a couple of clients before I'd actually chosen my company name, before I'd got uh, like, um, the the sort of in, uh, account sorted before I'd signed up for like self-employed or anything and then I decided to sort of like go as a limited company so it was all a bit sort of back to front of how I got started um which I actually quite liked because it meant I had work before I started the agency and it was a bit more comfortable um and then you know obviously from your advice Katie fairly soon after I started my agency I started podcast as well because I loved your podcast and you hooked me up with with the the podcast guys and I 
I thought, you know, I love this format. It's, I really enjoy it. And it means I can get to know my audience. So that was one of the first things I did when I started because I wanted to start getting my brand name out there. But I'm not very good with sort of direct sales um, and things like that. So I, I knew I couldn't do that. So I wanted something that was just a bit more where people could just get to know me and find out more about me and what I stand for. Um, so I finished my first season of that. Um, over the summer so that was good I've got another season to do soon um, which will be really good Um, but yeah it's been a bit of a weird journey um, and it's just been it's weird opening your agency but just doing it on your own it's quite lonely I don't know if you found that when you first started yeah we were talking about this weren't we because there is another step on that has happened since do you know what yes I mean I similarly to you didn't necessarily mean to start an agency (laughs) I think most agencies were started like this I actually started contracting uh doing new business and marketing for a large agency group and they're still a client of ours today I'm very proud to say and that was you know a big enough contract for me you know that gave me kind of three days work paid really really well gave me some flexibility and then just as people started to see that I was you know doing this work and that I was contracting I had more and more approaches via mainly actually via LinkedIn that grew me out to a stage where I was like oh my goodness I can't do all of this work on my own so then very quickly literally within a couple of months employed someone um, who actually was still at uni, lovely Scarlett, shout out to Scarlett, uh, who's still a very good friend of mine and was an amazing person to have in the business early days, full of energy and enthusiasm and wanted to learn. And so she came on part-time while she was still at uni and then needed some more senior help. So got another good someone you know that I knew in the industry kind of a good friend who again is still a very good friend now yeah. Daniel Ward Murphy shout out to him who came in to contract and kind of lead marketing for some of the larger clients that we'd started to to win so you know suddenly within a few months we were doing about you know 25 30 grand a month and I hadn't I hadn't I hadn't expected to get there anywhere yeah. near so so quickly um and, and we just did so I think you know I didn't I didn't find it that lonely because there wasn't that long for me to be lonely. I was probably only on my own for like a month or two. Um, but it is harder when you're on your own. Um, and you've yeah. had made some changes. And I think, like you say, that diversity of thought, we were talking about this earlier, guys. So sorry, spoiler alert, because we're going to talk about it again now. But I think the diversity of thought and the, the ability when you're a sole founder to bounce things off someone and just have that second opinion um, is tough. And obviously, yeah. I am still I am still a sole founder at Street, but you have done something slightly different, haven't you? Yeah. So instead of taking on an employee, um, one of our friends who Katie and I both used to work with, Anne-Marie, she joined the business in May. And instead of doing um, an employee um, employee relationship, we decided to split the business 50-50 um, so that she could have a real uh, a, a stakeholder that that is it's a different mentality i think you know she really wanted to have that ownership of the business and really sort of pour her heart and soul into it and it it felt really right um and we're both on similar areas of our career where we've been over 20 years in marketing um but we complement each other so well cuz i'm a bit airy fairy creative i like ideas and um sometimes they can be a bit wild and wacky and then amory is really good on um being the sensible head and but also she loves the research and the data and take making me take take a step back so i we we complement each other really well like that and also it works for clients as well cuz um, they've got Anne Marie's business analysis background, and then they've got my um, sort of more creative ideas content background. So it actually works out not just well for the agency, but for us as a, a you know for all of our clients as well. And you know, even from when we started, and Anne Marie sort of looked at the website, and she's like, "Well, looking at the clients, do you think this would resonate? And would do you think this would talk talk to the people that we're actually trying to aim at and you know that second opinion of what we're how, what we're trying to say and how we're trying to say it which is what I desperately wanted um because I'm such an imposter syndrome type person I think I can't I second guess everything so nothing ends up um to be you know very strong in my own context it's weird because I can do it for clients clients I'm very sure and um 
you know, I've done the research the data. I'm like, this is where we're going. I did the research on myself and then still couldn't um, have the confidence in, in what I was doing. So it's really nice because we can bounce off and give each other confidence as well. Um, cause Amory also suffers from imposter syndrome. So <laughs> we have to, we have to keep each other going and keep our confidence levels up, which is, you know, is, is a really interesting thing. But I think for, for someone who doesn't, you know, doesn't have confidence, that second person's great. And it's, it's been good for us both as well because, you know, we have other challenges. We both have very young children. Hers is three, mine is six. Um, you know, I have fibromyalgia, uh, which makes me, you know, a, it's a chronic in- illness, which makes me quite tired. So having to do everything on my own is really hard. You know, it's like new business, client work, marketing, you've got to do everything. And it's really hard. So having someone that can pick up the slack when I need them to, um, and I can pick up the slack from her if she needs me to, it, it make it works really well. So yeah, it's been, I mean, I was doing six months, I think it was until Amory came on. So, you know, it's, it was a good sort of chunk of time where I was doing it on my own. And I definitely recommend having someone. If you can't have an employee though, I'd say like have a mentor or someone that you can talk to regularly because it's just sense checking and getting a different opinion of things, which I find really useful. Definitely. Do you know what? I I mean, we've just been talking about some dramas, haven't we? That we've that I've just recently yeah. experienced at Street. And you know, it is really tough running a business for so many, you know, so many things which are out of your control around, you know, staff and you know, you you can only ever do your best. So I I honestly advocate so much having a mentor. I've always had a mentor. I now have a non-exec um, who's built and sold an agency and actually does quite a lot of client work for us nowadays as well. So, you know, having someone to talk to, it's a bit like anything, it's like business counselling, but it kind of ends up being all sorts of other counselling probably. But, you know, it's so important. I think having that diversity of thought and exactly like you've said, Anna, having different characters and different people yeah. that have, you know, that maybe deal with situations in a different way that's what makes agencies so damn magical because we're providing you know a thought or a perspective or an idea or whatever it might be to our clients that they're not able to generate inside because you do become certainly when you're client side and you'll know this and I, and I know yeah. I've also worked client side is you can become quite siloed and very you know understanding of your industry and very much an expert but I think agencies come in often with a real diversity of thought and having those different people within your agency to kind of build out that you know team of avengers or whatever you want to call them really makes a big difference i agree i mean i've uh, I, you know there's some industries when i used to work a lot with property and sort of those areas where you find that particularly um someone will be a sort of marketer that's gone from property to property marketing to property marketing and you see it in the job ads as well where they say must have five years or 10 years of experience I'm picking property again in property marketing and actually I'm a big advocate for hiring outside of your 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 area so I mean like with gaming I'd never done gaming marketing before but I brought you know 20 different sectors experience into gaming which allowed us to do some amazing stuff and I really I mean this is what's great about hiring agency staff as well to go in-house because they've got a lot of experience of lots of different sectors and they're really um it's really great for them to um to bring that in house and and i i it, whenever i see these adverts and it's like must have 10 years experience in this particular sector i'm like no get some diversity in there get some different thoughts inside inside your business because it will actually make you stand out from the competition because you find certain sectors are very samey their marketing is very samey and you you just don't get any standouts from the crowd. Yeah, you're so you're so it's so funny actually. I was actually talking about this uh, at the weekend with a friend of mine who doesn't work in an, in this industry at all. He works in finance, um, and we were saying it used to be the case that you went off to school, you studied for your career, and you stayed in that sector in that career for your whole life. And people moving around or moving from di to different sectors just didn't happen. Whereas now, I definitely feel like the right kind of future focused businesses and the right kind of more innovative people totally understand that moving, I'm not saying to change a job every six months, but you yeah. know, moving into different sectors, into different spaces, working in industries that you've maybe not worked in before, 
it happens a lot. And actually, I think it gives you a much better diversity of thought. You don't, you know, I'm not saying if you're a doctor, you might want to go, you know, totally change your career. That's, there are some places where, you know, you know I guess you stay, you've studied so far to be something that you you might want to stay with it. Well, maybe not, who knows? But I think that diversity that we have in the agency world is so important. And it's something that you and Anne-Marie certainly bring together really nicely. Um, right, we always talk about new business on here. So before I start talking about how to get your voice heard, what I want to talk about is the journey that, again, you spoke to me about just before we went live, which was how obviously you'd built up and you'd, you had enough clients to, to look after you. But then, of course, you brought on Anne-Marie and she needed to also have some work to do. So how did you approach getting those new clients in the door? Um, ours has all been through networks because I'm not very good at approaching people. I think it's the confidence thing, um, particularly cold reaching out to people. Uh, so I, I really struggle with that. So for me, I surround myself with communities. So Mums in Marketing is amazing one. Um, the Espresso Plus community, which is um, a LinkedIn community. You Are The Media, which is a local one down here in Bournemouth, which is amazing for um, just getting to know other people. And um, just sort of little communities that I find here, there and everywhere. And that's pretty much 100% how I've got my work is through all these communities um, or through connections through clients. So, you know, I, I had a client and they, I was doing some work for them and there was another agency that was doing work for them. I was like, oh, I really want to meet this other agency because they might be quite useful for me too. So then I met the agency and then we started doing some work together and, and we've, you know, got a few clients together. So there's been nothing that's been sort of cold outreach for me. It's because um, that's not, I'm, I want to be a you know, go a little bit more into that zone because I do need to brave it a little bit. Um, you know, not completely cold, but that sort of reaching out a bit more out of my comfort zone. But for me, it's starting where you're comfortable and making sure, you know, because I have a huge network of people that I've known for, you know, a long, long time. I've been in marketing for 20 something odd years. And I don't want to say exactly because it will show my age then. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, you, were, you were saying that I'm saying think oh my gosh how long have I been same 20 yeah I, mean, I didn't go to uni so I have been at work and I was one of the youngest in the year since I was 17 so 23 years I've worked in sales and marketing scary yeah yeah it's 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 a long time and uh and so you, you know you build up your networks and actually if if someone's young listening to this build up your network because it's really important like I've been plugging away at it for you know 20 years and and probably in the last 12 years has been my most e biggest effort and that is so important because when you need something people reach out to you and they get to know you and they want you to you know and, and you've already built that bond so when they're ready to buy I mean because I didn't need my network before when I was at game to to sell services to because I was at game, I was in house, so I didn't need it as much, but I still worked on that network. And I feel like sometimes people maybe think they're a little bit too good to work on their network. I'm not sure if that's the right thing, but you know, they don't need their network, but actually you never know what's going to change. You know, you might be out of a job, you might start your own business and that network you could have started 10 years ago. You're suddenly starting from scratch now and and then it becomes more difficult because they don't know you and you'll you'll find it much harder. So, you know, I say start your networks before you've ever needed them because, you know, you can help and reach out people. And when you need them, they're there if you do. And they're really helpful and, and want you to do some work for them. So it's, yes. it's, it's a longevity thing. Be helpful, be kind, keep showing mm -hmm. up. You know, nurturing those relationships is so important. So Explain a little bit more deeply, Anna. Sorry, I'm always digging for the for the extra info. How ha I mean, obviously attending those events and being part of those networks, but how do you how do you continually nurture and show up in those in those networks? So you've joined them. I guess you're commenting on stuff. You're attending events. What yep. kind of time do you put against that? Um, I put quite a lot of time. So you know, people maybe not always see me so visually on um social so linkedin etc they don't always see me um I, i'm not as co like a prolific poster as i probably should be but what you i will be doing behind the scenes is messaging people congratulating them on their new jobs on like oh what are you doing now what's interesting and i don't 
there's nothing I need from them at this point. I'm just interested in what's happening, what they're doing. Um, you know, it, it might be um, that I've seen something they've asked for help. So I'll give them a bit of help on something, um, you know, just um, supportive in um, mums in marketing community. People are always asking questions of, can anyone help me with this? Can people do this? So we just help each other. And like, I'm happy like to give talks, you know, and uh, to, to people's audiences to, you know, to help them understand a subject a bit more. You know, in the past, I've run networking groups as well, just to help people out. And I don't want anything from them. You know, I think that's it going in, not wanting anything from them, just being, like you said, kind and helpful, but actually realizing now when I needed them, that actually, oh, there is a reason why you do this. If you, you know, sometimes in the end, you know, there is a selfish reason in, in the end, yeah. uh, you know, there's no denial that, that actually, even though you don't realize it at the time, there might, you know, something does come back for you, if that makes any sense, even if yeah. you've not. And, and everything that I've done with client, like the clients that I've got through my network, I've not pushed them to it. I've just said, oh, I'm freelancing now, or I'm doing this now. And, and it's just when people have gone, oh, okay, yeah, that's great. Or I've seen someone say, oh, I really need someone that can do content strategy. Oh, I can do it. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's just doing those, um, just keeping your eye out for for things um, and, and, and find useful because I find, you know, people that have um, their own businesses, um, particularly those that have come out of in-house, I've, I've seen a lot of those struggle to have their own businesses because they've not got a network um, and they haven't um, built it because they didn't feel like they needed to. And then you really struggle because you, you've, you've sort of got, you've literally got to start from scratch with the moment you start your business. So you're probably five, 10 years behind people that have grown their networks. Um, and so it, it does make it a little bit harder. Um, and actually, if you're going to start your own business, maybe plan it in six months or a year's time and start building this network beforehand just to start get going in, in advance. Yeah, you get out what you put in with any of these networks. We're members of Beamer, members of Pimento, members, you know, there's yeah. probably a lot more. You know, I could be members with uh, on more, I'm sure. Um, we do, we're quite active on Guild because that's a great marketing community platform. But, you know, you've got to pick the ones that you know are going to work for you and you've got to continue to show up. It is, you know, flexing that that you know consistency muscle again I talk about this a lot but it's so so true you will get out what you put in I've heard people say oh well, yeah I didn't really get much from it well it, but did, how much effort did you put into engaging how much effort did you put into spending time within the community because if you don't do anything it's not just going to come to you that isn't how life works it's like with anything so you know you need to join these groups in these communities but you also need to show up continually and be helpful and I don't think it is bad you know I, I agree there's some kind of guilt isn't there that you go oh I'm yeah. just not showing up and being nice to everyone and being fake because but you're not you're you're showing up and you are actually you know that's why I do the podcast it's why I'm sure you one of the reasons you've launched your podcast Anna you I yeah. genuinely want to help lots of people I cannot have a hundred thousand clients I can't have a hundred clients probably at the moment you know we at any one point at our maximum are, you know maybe between I don't know, 10 and 20 clients usually. And that's enough for us. But I can help a lot more people than that. And that's warming up my, you know, the relationship that I have with my potential future audience, my potential future clients, and genuinely helping them. And, you know, they will work with me because I am going to help them do something. So it's not selfish. If I'm good at my job and good at what I do, there's no harm yeah. in talking about it and helping people and showing up because, they might genuinely need your help and you're going to do them a favor by helping them. So don't feel bad about it is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's true. I, I often feel guilty about it and I should, you know, I love like my podcast. I love helping people because I found that the reason I did crossing the content chasm is because people really struggled with crossing the content chasm, you know, going from um, creating little or no content to start creating content and being a bit brave and daring with it. And I just wanted to give people a little bit of reassurance. I mean, people know from my podcast, I'm pretty honest with how my content journey goes and my 134 takes of a homepage video that never got onto the homepage because I still hated it. 
Um, you know, and I like to, to people to know that they're not alone because even us experienced people, you know, I love creating stuff for clients, but when it comes to creating my own stuff, I'm absolutely rubbish at it because I'm just so, I, I just second guess myself all the time. And I, I like that human side of it with podcasts where you can talk and you can be very open about how you're struggling, how you're getting on. And, um, when I launched my podcast, I did a behind the scenes. So, you know, maybe it'll help other people start their own podcasts. I mean, there is a selfish reason behind that. I love listening to podcasts. So if more people start their podcasts, I've got more to listen to. So, you know, there was a bit of a selfish reason because there were so many people in my network I'd love to hear a podcast from. So fingers crossed, they'll start them. Hey guys, I am interrupting very quickly to tell you a little about my other business, not Street Agency, which I've probably talked about a bit today on the podcast, but also I am the co-founder of Tamba. Tamba is, well, it is everything that you need to know to attract and win more new clients, basically. It empowers you and teams within your business or agency with all of the tools, knowledge, training, events, templates, everything that you need to attract and win more clients, more businesses, whatever it is that you need to help your business grow. So if you haven't checked it out already, there are some free resources on the website. Go and pop into Google www.tanba.io. That stands for the Agency New Business Academy. Io, so T-A-N for naughty, B-A dot I-O. And you'll get some access to some free events that we've got coming up, some free content that is available on the website, as well as learning lots and lots more about the platform itself. Yeah, you've inspired some, definitely. I loved all that content you're putting out, by the way, Anna. It was really, really good. Oh. And like you say, really helpful for those that were, you know, looking to start their own podcast. So you're now running your own content agency. One of the subjects we really wanted to delve into today was how, well, I guess businesses, agencies, whoever can develop strategies to ensure their voices are heard. So tell me a little bit about your views on that. Okay. Well, this is actually because we've slightly changed our agency as well. So we've moved a little bit away from content too. So we started um, getting a lot of uh, questions about um, strategy. Um, And as you know, like when I was account director and that we did a lot of strategy when I was a gamer, did a lot of strategy. And so we've we've actually in the last few months moved away from content and content strategy to just general uh, marketing strategy because we were finding that um, a lot of the brands that we were working with and and the agencies, because we work with agencies, too, that they were struggling to formulate a plan to to be a bit different and to get to voices heard not just with content but with marketing altogether and we took a step back because a lot of the companies work for even global organizations don't always have the data and the research and the information so they didn't understand their audience they didn't understand who they were talking to uh, they didn't understand what platforms they're on you know what content they consumed which made it really hard to then start creating content for them so what we decided to do is pull ourselves back to work on the strategic side of it amory with her business analysis background um, works fantastically well for this and what we were finding uh, with the content the reason we did this is cuz everyone would come to us and say we need a blog. I swear, if I hear those words again, it drives me mad. Not everybody needs a blog. It's not, (laughs) it's literally the first thing that everyone comes to us without understanding if their clients wanted a blog, if their clients actually read blogs, if, if they had the time to do it, if the, you know, if the platform was right for it. And so uh, after hearing uh, we need a blog uh, about 300 times, I thought, do you know what, this is driving me mad. So this is why we pulled it back because what I was finding is that people were just thinking about like one or two different content types. They weren't thinking, like I said, where their audience, were, what they wanted, how much time they would, did they actually have time to write a blog? Did they have the money for us to write a blog? What, you know, what were the implications of it? Um, and also every time that we spoke to people, they um, they were very limited on 
like their thought process of of why they came to a blog or why they came to their marketing. You know, we found that um, teams hadn't had much experience of different channels. I mean, I recently I've I've recently cobbled together a, a graphic that I put on my uh, LinkedIn, which listed sort of sixty four different content types that you could do. Um, because I was so fed up with people hearing I want a blog. <laughs> um, and so when we pulled ourselves back, we we thought this was the best way to get people to get their voices heard because if you're not writing to the um doing content to the right audience and doing something different from your competitors, it's very hard to get your voice heard. You know, you are doing the same thing as everyone else, a bit like what we're saying with, you know sectors I pick sorry property sector I did pick you out there but you know accountants lawyers there's loads of sectors that do very very similar stuff and it was that it's that that sort of homogenous thinking internally I'm reading a great book at the moment Rebel Ideas by Matthew Sy yes I've heard great things about that book it's not I've not read it yet but I have heard great things amazing it's absolutely amazing and as he gives some great examples of the CIA how they missed certain events because everybody saw thoughts very similarly inside and this is what we were finding this is why we were getting people saying we want a blog because everyone was thinking very very similar inside you know people hire people that look and think like them you know, you see these adverts, um, you need to fit into the company culture. And often that means that you need, that they want harm- harmony. They want people to fit in and think like them and be like them because it does create a much more harmonious working place. And what company culture should be is protect, not like that, probably not so close. Company culture should be a div- diverse way of thinking. And I'm not saying hire people that are horrible because they will upset everyone. But this different, where different ideas, where you can have a slightly heated debate about something because you've got different points of views and it's a quality debate. I'm not talking like shouting at each other, but having a debate um, from different points of views that are really valid and it rather than someone going, going, I've got a great idea and everyone going, yes, Yes, that's a great idea, you know, because that does not challenge things. So internally, these people going, oh, we need a blog. And everyone's going, we need a blog. You know, everyone cheering at the same time, we need a blog. They all had the same way of thinking and the same ideas. And, you know, it happens in-house. It does happen agency side as well. Although agencies tend to be a bit more diverse, you do see sometimes when you see um, the agency way of li- life, you know, as a, as a parent to a young child, I, agency life was not very welcoming to me. So you may not get as many parents there, you know, from the pace, you know, you don't, don't always get people with disabilities, with different backgrounds, you know, um, you, you know, you, you end up sort of like maybe with quite a middle class background of people that have had been able to go through degree level, et cetera. You know, I'm, I'm actually from um, a very working class, class background from a council estate. No one knows, realizes this because I sound a bit fairly posh. <laughs> but you, you do know, sound I, very posh. I, I'm I'm from a working class background. Um, you know, my, my, I grew up in a council estate. I went to my first two schools were like two of the worst schools in the area. You know, very very rough. Um, and so when people hire me, they think that I fit in with this this sort of feeling of middle class, uh, you know, type of person that thinks very similar to them. But I have a very different upbringing. You know, we had no money. I had one point, one pair of uh, jogging trousers and one jogging top, which my mum had to keep re-sewing over and over again. You know, I didn't get Christmas presents. You know, we were, we did not have any money. So I, I bring a bit of a different way of thinking, particularly, it's probably why I'm quite left-leaning as well, because I've been in the the sort of poverty area. I know what it's like um, to to be there. So I, I do like the social system and things like that. But it, all of that is part of how I think. And you do have to be careful when you're saying that you want a company culture that fits because, you know, it cannot be too many people thinking the same way and having the same ideas. You need that mix because that is what will get your voice heard because your audience is diverse and you need to be able to see what's coming and you need to be able to predict, um, you know, what they want to see in the future as well. I mean, it, I read, read a stat recently that um, companies with diverse thinking actually do better with change and they actually make more profit. 
So, I mean, it's, I don't know if you saw that, um, it was that video, the, the racist soap dispenser, which um, it's a video and there's a white guy that puts his hand under the soap dispenser, gets some soap. And there's a black guy that puts his hand under the soap dispenser and he doesn't get any soap because it hadn't accounted for a darker skin. And actually, I'm very pale, very, very pale. And I actually have the same problem. You know, those that like you get the white sinks and then you get um, the taps that are um, uh, that tell that your hands under it. I can't always get those to work because um, I'm so pale and I have to put my hands right up to the ta- tap to get them wow. to work because I'm like similar color to the, the white basin. So you see like that actually people haven't thought about things. And I, actually, I think one of the worst ones was the, was it the PlayStation marketing campaign where they'd brought out the white PlayStation? I don't remember if you remember it, but basically it was the, um, there was a black lady on a black background and there was a white lady on a back, white background. And it said something like white is better than black or white blin, win, wins over black. And I was like, did you not have anyone sense check this it was it was just like a it just looked like a racist campaign and it was it is it is and I mean yeah I mean if you don't have diversity you could stand out in your market but for not very good reasons um but if you have more diversity and and and, and people in different ways of thinking and it is there's so many different diversities I said backgrounds you know religion um sexual orientation disabilities uh, you know, how much money someone has, age, gender, you know, there's so many different ones, uh, you know, uh, race. I mean, I think we f- focus on two or three different ones, which tends to be sort of race, religion, gender. But actually, there's so many nuances in our lives. No one has had the same background and trying to find people that are um, sort of standing out, you know, will help you stand out and think a bit differently. That's how you stand out and have your voice heard. Because otherwise, you tend up tend to end up producing the same thing over and over and over again and it's uh, you know it's that like what what we've always done and it keeps churning out the same thing and that's not going to get your voice heard if you're the same as your competitors if you're the same as you know your uh you've always done it's just just gets a bit boring and to get your voice heard you need to be different and you need to try and new things and be, and be different from everyone and be be different from yourself as well sometimes <laughs> So I, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about this subject because it it frustrates me because, you know, we get a lot of the same questions over and over again. And you can tell sometimes the people that come to us have not, you know, that there's been one thought behind it and they've all thought similarly and all agreed with each other. And it's, it's not based on, on the market or their audience, which is very frustrating. (laughs) Yeah, I'm so with you. And I've I've sadly worked at lots of agencies that are the same that have, you know, recruited in their image and, and it is it's it's a quite a natural thing to do, but it's um it doesn't give you that diversity. And can I just say, Anna, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um that was really brave and probably quite emotional for you. And I think, you know, we are all very, very different. And like exactly like you say, there are so many ways to recruit and build a diverse team that isn't just about yeah like you say whether you're a man or a woman or your gender or you know your sexual orientation or there are certain ones that are you know or you know your your race etc there is there are so many ways that we can look at diversity and actually I think the one that you've picked up on there is one that isn't talked about enough Mm -hmm. and actually probably has one of the largest impacts you know the kind of social demographic and you know how you've been brought up is so important you know, the world is changing and, and we see that so much you know, gen z we're doing a lot of campaigns for clients at the moment around you know the future audience mm. gen z you know my daughter is and and your son is, is your son a gen z or is he i don't know i guess he's six so, yeah i'm not sure if he's still included uh, yeah. or not no but you know they're there's going to be a very big change because they have been brought up differently. They've experienced different things. They've grown up in COVID. They, you know, the, the, you have to think about your audience. And I think so many businesses, agencies, you know, and it doesn't, it's not, this isn't just agencies, businesses think that they know 
how to show up and think they've got the answers, but they haven't researched their audience. They don't understand the diversity of their audience. And sometimes you'll need to do, you know, you'll have to segment your audience and do different, you know, try different things that kind of map with different elements of the audience that that are going to resonate with them differently. I think that's really important. It's funny, actually, I read this um, research and I cannot find it again. And it was the best research I've ever read. And it was talking about what different people have in common. And it took people from age demographics and sort of worked out what they have in common and gave them a score. And then it took like random things like people that like brown bread. And it found that people that like brown bread have more in common than all of Gen Z. You know, that that people put people into these, um, like I said, the, the sort of uh, generational sort of things. And yet actually they're so diverse in themselves, aren't they? You know, what you were saying that they've got their their beliefs and their, their you know, what's really interesting into in, them. Um, and it was so fascinating because, you know, the demographics that we've always known are actually becoming so irrelevant because every new generation is, you know, we've become more and more diverse. Our thoughts and feelings are becoming more diverse. And, you know, you, you're better segmenting against brown bread rather than, you know, <laughs> Gen Z half the time. And I really wish I could find this research because it was absolutely brilliant. It gave loads of great examples of how they tested it against different likes and dislikes and against oh. different demographics. And it was- Anna, if you can find it, that would be amazing because we can put it in the show notes. Yeah, I'll see if I can find it. I've been looking for it for a couple of months and it's it was absolutely fascinating. Oh no, okay, probably not. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep going. Um, but it's just showing that like, you know, there's such diverse of thought, you know, you know, within different di- demographics and different categories. And like you said, you've really got to know your audience and understand. It's like when I was in gaming, you know, gamers are not all gamers. I was working with a company a little while ago and they was wanted to put some gaming wording in um, their their text. And they sort of said, oh, you know, can we put like, get your kill shot? I'm go- I said, well, that doesn't relate to FIFA gamers. You know, you don't get a kill shot in in FIFA, you know, there's different genres of gaming within one one thing, and what you say to one game gamer doesn't re- uh, resonate with others. Um, and this is where I think we're getting these smaller audiences as well. You know, there's with um, brands need to start talking to smaller audiences, smaller communities on a much more personal level to show they get them. But that also includes internally having people that get the communities because if if all your communities are like middle-aged white guys and some of the communities are young women or you know diff- different communities they might not get them so having that diversity inter- internally helps you navigate these different communities and understand them a little bit better as well yeah it's really interesting something that we're seeing a lot of at the moment in terms of briefs from um you know our brand and business clients through to the our agency and tech businesses is around you know they have continually communicated and marketed to a certain audience which is a bit older who and I'm, this is all going to sound a bit brutal but I'm just going to say it how it is Go that it. are sadly <laughs> dying now yeah. and they hadn't thought about how they were going to communicate with you know the other generations and I'm not saying that you shouldn't communicate to the older audience but we're evolving and changing as people as a world as a community ourselves so you've you've really I would you know I mean, it's a really interesting subject that you've highlighted here for us today, Anna, because I think you've really got to think about who your audience are, who they are today, but who are they going to be in five years? Because if you don't start communicating a bit like we were talking about earlier from a networking point, you know, it's the, it, the same rules apply, right? You know, you've got to start networking with those people that are going to be your customers in five, 10, 15 years time now, because if you don't, they will be engaging with someone else, building a relationship with another business or another bank or another you know, retailer and going to them and not you because you didn't engage them early enough and they built relationships elsewhere and it's going to be really hard for you to get you know, network to them. So, but it is the same rules apply. So you really have to understand that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we've um, I work with a lot of um, big B2B organizations and they work a lot with senior leaders and you know, we've been talking a lot about social media, TikTok, et cetera. And they're like, well, you know, the senior leaders, they're older, they're not on TikTok, but, you know, quite a lot of them actually are, you know, there is a growing senior um, people on TikTok, but actually exactly what you're saying, that the people on TikTok 
are going to be the senior leaders in 10 or 15 years time, you know, so you're building that seed. I think the problem is a lot of people don't look long term. It's very short term, but actually in 10, 10 years, I mean, some of them in five years, you know, some of these uh, Gen, Z, Gen Z are, um, you know, so switched on they're probably going to be our lead you know senior leaders in five years time so you know we're you you you're gonna to have to you know you need to start marketing to them now when they're juniors so that when they get to the leaders they're like oh okay yep here we go we're ready to to bring you on and it's that long-term strategy and long-term pipeline yeah, that's exactly the thing is, you know, you've got to start thinking about the future now. There is no tomorrow. You have to start doing it today. Um, Anna, one last question before I let you go and enjoy the rest of your Monday. Yeah. Um, and it's Halloween. Happy Halloween. We're recording this on Halloween. I feel like we should have been here in fancy dress today. I've really I've, let the side down. I've got tights on. I've um, got orange tights. Have you? Skull and crossbow. I don't, I'm not sure if I can show you. <laughs> oh my gosh no you need to because we now go on youtube i feel like there's got okay. to be a way okay hold on i can't lift my leg that i'm not that fit hold on here we go get a leg up get a leg up here we go Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love them. And I love the pairing with the star socks. I mean, that is cool. Oh my gosh. And of course, I feel, I mean, I'm wearing black. Is that count? Not, I'm, I need Fair to, enough. I should have thought about this this morning. Um, and sorry for those of you listening on uh, on Apple or wherever else, um, Spotify, etc. You'll have to go and check out the street YouTube channel to go and see Anna's my, fantastic my, tights, which I'm now very jealous of. My tights. Um, my sock and slipper combo it's very sexy I like it I like it you've worked in a lot of businesses both agency and brand side what tips can you give for companies looking to I guess attract more diverse talent to solve some of these problems if any I'm putting you on the spot here to to help you know to listen to your internal voices and attract more diverse talent think that the thing is looking at the hiring process because you know constantly I'm looking at job job ads you know just to see what's around um and I see you know the same language you know there's beer Fridays pizza Fridays you know that generally attracts more of a male audience you know there's non-flexible working which is no good for parents you know it's it's looking about how and it's the language you use there's um some great um resources online where you can look at the type of language that women um like in job ads and men like in job ads and there's different language that appeals to them so making sure you're including a bit of both in those so that it appeals to both audiences um you know just looking at you know how the company's structured so for example um i see like a lot of networking events and a lot of companies you know they start at 9 how does that work around working parents you know that have to drop their kids at school you know i have a, a send child you know special education needs he cannot go to breakfast club he can't go to after school club so how can you work around us parents that we have great value in um being able to, to bring to a company but we're not catered for, you know, how, and, you know, for me, I need to work flexibly, which is another reason I like having my own business. Um, look at how, like how your advertising jobs, like, are you just showing pictures of white guys in your job ads, you know, or on your website, because people want to see people like them in them. Are you showing just old people, young people, you know, make sure it's got a diverse demographic, you know, it's, and also your marketing actually is a lot to play. So for example, if someone was going to somewhere like game, um, you might think, oh, I might be a bit old, you know, I'm a bit old to work for game, you know, all their marketing has young people on that look cool and interesting. But actually, you know, there's a gaming is so diverse. Why not have, you know, big people, small people, you know, young people, old people, you know, have all those different ones just in your general marketing, because then you look like much more of a diverse company because, you know, the people that you're going to hire probably follow your company anyway, and they want to see a bit more about you. And there's other things you can do, blind hiring, so, um, well, blind CV, so you can't see someone's name or gender, which is a really good one. Um, you know, having more people with diverse points of view looking at CVs. So, for example, someone might see offer a year for maternity leave oh I don't want that you know that because they don't they think that's that's not great on a CV or something you know because people do think like that whereas a, a mum would be like oh that's amazing she's been off for a year and she's learned so much you know there's so many different 
points of view of hiring. So you need to get that diverse things. Interview processes. So interview processes are awful for neurodivergent people. You know, some people do not do, do well at that formal interview process. So how can you adopt a different approach to that? So there's so many small things that add up to a big things. And also going specifically out to, you know, mums in marketing, where if you want a marketer and you want, you want a mum, you know, or, you know, different groups. Um, there was one that I've um, met recently, which was Be Digital. So that is a platform for black marketeers. And I saw them at Brighton SEO. And it's about helping black voices get heard in um, the marketing community and get um, hired more. So, you know, they love people approaching them. So, uh, you know, if you approach Be Digital and say you want to hire someone, they can send it out to their networks. So you're sending it to more diverse networks as well, which I think is really important. You know, and, and when we hire, we will practice what we preach and and try and do all of this. And I'm not saying people are going to get it perfect because, you know, you've just got to try things and learn from it. You know, you're not going to be suddenly amazingly diverse overnight. It, it does take a while for people to to change eyes and read books like Rebel Ideas by Matthew Side because they're really useful <laughs> for getting that different perspective. But you know, there are loads of things people can do, and don't I don't think people need to take it as one big thing. We must suddenly be 100 diverse. Do these steps, you know, blind, blind CVs, get people to take the name off the CV, or a hiring panel that's a bit more diverse. You know, those are small things that a business can do that is not too stressful and not too hard. And that's a step. Do that step, then do another step, and then do another step, and then you'll get there, I think. Anna, I love that advice. You're just making me think about my hiring process now. And I think I'm, you know, I'm pretty open-minded, but we, of course, at Street, we, you know, we attract a certain... I don't know if we do attract a certain demographic. We attract a lot of women because I'm, I think that's because I'm yeah. a woman and I do have flexible working. We run a four day week. I'm actually thinking about changing that slightly. So it's kind of like, these are your hours, flexible working, work yeah. whenever you want to work. Because, and you know what? A lot of these things I've introduced because I have, you know, been in a bad place when I've been employed by others. Once I was put on disciplinary because I kept turning up to work a couple of minutes past nine. And this was somewhere that I worked, you know, I'm not going to say too much. It'll be obvious where it was and I don't want to be mean to them. Um, but maybe I should be. Um, but you know, I worked really hard for them. I would be working evenings, work late, work through my lunch. I would show up at five minutes past nine occasionally because I had my school, my daughter's school gates didn't open till 8.45 yeah. and it was a 15 minute drive to get there. And if there was any traffic, I would in the middle of Russia. I couldn't change it. Her school was tiny. They didn't have a breakfast club. I had no other way of getting to her to school and me to work because they, they decided that I needed to be at my desk at nine. And they gave me disciplinary and pulled me aside. And actually, the person that pulled me aside was also a mum who also was often late to work. It was very bizarre. But things like that, like, you know, th I, that is the reason that I left them because I was so pissed off that they treated me like that. You know, yeah. Excuse my French. So yeah. I've implemented a lot of those kind of things in the street workplace because I've had personal experiences of it, which means, you know, that I do have you know, two mums. In fact, two of them just coming back off maternity leave. You know, one of them, you know, very well. Um, and, you know, I've implemented things within the, the my business that does mean that I attract a certain, you know, a mum maybe um, yeah. or women or, you know, people that want, that want and adopt that more flexible working. But I definitely could do more. I love the idea um, of the, is it blindsiding, did you say? So of, you know, making sure, and, and, and again, having a really diverse interview panel. I think that's really great advice. So many great things. And advertising, what you do, making it clear on your yeah. website, putting content like this out about it, that will really help as well. Yeah, and I think, just going back to your point, like um, I did read recently that um, female-headed companies actually have more diverse staff. And I think it's exactly what you said, because... Although um, you were saying like you, from a woman's perspective, you know what it's like to, to work, but I think we're naturally more switched on because we've been through that with ourselves. We're actually more switched on to other diversities and helping them as well, because we're like, right, how can we make this work for different people that we can get that diversity? So um, yeah, the recent research I read said that, that female led companies are generally more diverse anyway, which is, I thought was really interesting. Love that. 
What a great way to end. Anna, I could literally talk to you for so much longer. We need to find a way that we can collaborate more within our businesses and the podcast and everything. But it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, And yeah, I've really, really enjoyed today's conversation. You've really inspired me to go and look at lots of things within street (laughs) agency and change things on the website and all sorts. Oh, I love it. I love it. Do you know what though? I've I've sort of thought of a few things I've said here and I'm like, hmm, I'm going to do that myself as well. So it's, uh, you you know, I've, I've, I've jugged myself into action as well. It's good. Well, that's what it's all about. And hopefully, guys, you listening will also um, have been egged on to go and implement some of these amazing things that Anna's really spoken about. And I've chipped in here and there today. So big thank you, Anna, for joining me. I hope you have all been inspired as much as we have been. Um, and yeah, and we hear you back here or you hear us back here again soon. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. See, I told you, I mean, I tell you this every week, but wasn't that an awesome episode? Oh my goodness, it has inspired me to go and look at so much within my businesses. So I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. If you did enjoy it, please do go on to Apple Podcasts and give us a little five-star review, leave your comments. And if you've got anything that you want to hear about on the podcast, feel free to pop me a little email, katie, K-A-T-I-E, at street.agency. That's katie, K-A-T-I-E, at street.agency. I hope you enjoyed today. I hope it's inspired you to take some action within your business. And I also hope that you're back with us again very, very soon.